For thousands of years, the Dead Sea has been a unique and mysterious water body that has captured the imagination of people around the world. But now, something incredible has happened. After centuries of being a source of wonder, the Dead Sea has finally dried up. And what has emerged from the depths is truly astonishing. People are flocking to the shores of the former Dead Sea to witness the incredible transformation. The area has become a hub of adventure and discovery. Let's get into the video to find out what is happening. The Dead Sea, the saltiest lake on Earth, is drying up as a result of the intense heat in the Middle East. It's a disaster for the people who live on its borders, but getting enough water to keep the sea alive will be difficult. It is so dense and mineral-rich that it does not even feel like normal water. Rather, it is like olive oil combined with sand. It is eight or nine times saltier than the oceans of the world. A trip to the Holy Land, or Jordan, would not be complete without at least one snapshot of a bather sitting perfectly still on the water surface, generally while reading a newspaper, to highlight the miraculous qualities of the region's spring-fred pools. However, the Dead Sea is also a special ecosystem and a reliable indicator of environmental health in a region where arid weather and the need to irrigate farms have combined to create a chronic water crisis. The Dead Sea, you may have heard, is on its last legs. You can understand why this might make for good copy, but unfortunately it's not entirely accurate. The rate of evaporation will finally equal the density and saltiness of the water, which are both increasing as the level falls. So it could shrink considerably, but it won't go away entirely. The surface level is falling by more than one meter annually though, which is a very concerning trend. Considering that the Dead Sea's surface is the lowest place on Earth, the lowest point on Earth is always shifting as it rises and falls with the seasons. It's so deep that your ears will pop as you travel the winding route down to the water's edge, just as in an airplane. Imagine the Grand Canyon with Lake Como tucked into its depths and you'll have an idea of the surreal lunar character of the Dead Sea surroundings. Even if they couldn't put their finger on it, ancient civilizations knew there was something special about this location. Stories abound in the Middle East about how Cleopatra employed local items as part of her beauty routine which is widely believed to have included ass's milk and almond extract. Although his tainted historical reputation does tend to devalue his worth as a celebrity endorser in the classic world, King Herod may have come here for his health as well, as he had a winter palace nearby. Since the Dead Sea was a rich deposit of salt, which was so highly prized at that time that it was even used as money, the Romans, when they occupied the Middle East, enforced strict military control over the roads leading to and from the sea. The positive effects on health appear to be genuine as well. As an asthma sufferer, I noticed a slight improvement in my condition due to the intense barometric pressure so far below sea level. Psoriasis sufferers also report improvement after bathing in mineral-rich water, using soothing mud, and basking under the bright sunlight. Therapeutic travel for people with the disease is funded by government and nonprofit organizations in various nations. The Dead Sea, despite its shifting and diminishing size, nonetheless has economic significance. Both Jordan and Israel have resorts that attract tourists, and both countries export cosmetics made in the region. Since some of the coastlines is in the occupied West Bank, Palestinians may one day benefit economically from the sea's special qualities. There is no denying the incredibly dramatic drop in water levels. To keep track of the water level during World War I, British engineers etched their initials into a rock. After a century, the scratch marks remain high up on the dry rock. To get to the current water level, one must descend the cliffs, traverse the bustling main road, navigate the swampy vegetation, and finally cross the gaping mudflat. It totals around 2 kilometers or 1.25 miles. The water's retreat has caused a major issue in the popular tourist destination of Ein Gedi, located a few kilometers further along the shore. The waves would splash up against the walls of the main structure as it was being constructed towards the end of the 1980s to house the restaurant, shower block, and gift store. A customized train pulled by a tractor now transports guests from the resort to the beach, an additional two kilometers away. It's unsettling for Nir Vanger, who oversees the commercial side of Ein Gedi's tourism activities. The sea was right here when I was 18 years old, he continues, implying that the time frame is not 500 or 1,000 years in the past. The Dead Sea was here, and now it's two kilometers distant. Between the tractor, the petrol, and the workers, we spend half a million dollars a year just to follow the sea. I was born here on the Dead Sea and have spent my entire life here. It's been a bit of a sad existence the last few years, though, 
as I've watched the landscape where I grew up slowly change and eventually vanish. When my wife asked if I wanted a sea view from our new home, I replied, no, we should build it so that we can look at the mountains instead, because mountains stay put while the sea is always changing. The Dead Sea has a severe microclimate, unusual chemistry, and towering camel-colored mountains, creating a landscape that Herod and Cleopatra would have recognized except for a few modern concrete hotels. For geologists, however, the lake is only the terminus of the River Jordan. Water enters at one end and does not leave at the other. Instead, it collects and evaporates. And while it would be a stretch to argue that the river that flows into the Dead Sea is dying, that is essentially what is happening. The wadis, or stony inlets, may become flooded during the brief rainy season, but otherwise, they remain dry and the river itself is scarcely more than a trickle. In the summer, you can practically step over it in some parts of Israel and the occupied West Bank. Christ was baptized in the Jordan, which at one time was one of the world's main waterways and is still a raging river prone to flooding in wet winters. It appears that theological considerations were just as important as scientific or navigational ones when the U.S. government sent a naval expedition to the Jordan River in 1847. The mission was conducted by a brave officer named William F. Lynch, who should be remembered for his work if for no other reason than he may have been the first to determine that the Dead Sea is lower than the surrounding ocean. What's more intriguing is his account of a river itself, where he encounters a succession of waterfalls five meters in height, separated by rapids and worries that he'll lose one or more of the expedition's boats. He describes the river as foaming and rushing like a mountain torrent, before stopping at the remains of an old bridge. About 80 years later, when the Jordan was still flowing, a Russian Zionist engineer named Pinchus Rutenberg built a hydroelectric power station in a desolate section of the river valley. The buildings from that power plant are still there today. The northern part of the Jordan still flows into the Sea of Galilee, and the southern part still flows south out of the Sea of Galilee and down into the Dead Sea. Therefore, the geography of the area hasn't altered much. As a result of the complex politics surrounding water in the Middle East, the volumes of water entering and leaving that system have shifted dramatically in recent decades. Israel has been steadily increasing the amount of fresh water it creates through desalination plants in the Mediterranean, but it still considers the Galilee to be a vital strategic water asset, so it built a dam across the southern section of the sea to control the amount of water flowing into the Jordan. In the 1950s, a full decade before the dam was built, the Israeli government began drawing water from the Jordan Valley system. And this is a dilemma for farmers in Jordan and the West Bank, who rely on water to irrigate their crops and provide food for their communities. Israel, despite having the financial and technological means to ensure that its own people never go thirsty, also faces challenges. Water for the Jordan comes from the Yarmouk, which flows through Syria. But over the past 30 years or so, the Syrians have constructed more than 40 dams in the Yarmouk to harness its water. Some Jordanians claim Syria constructed these dams as retaliation for the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan in 1994. As a result of the agreement, Jordan became consistent with Egypt, which had signed a similar pact in 1979, but it remained starkly at odds with other countries like Syria. Though some are willing to concede that the Syrians constructed the dams to meet the needs of their people, the fact remains that the dams have reduced the river's flow. And naturally, the Kingdom of Jordan has constructed dams for its own needs. Furthermore, the Jordan Valley is not the only region in the Middle East where a strategic dispute has arisen due to the construction of a dam. Iraq and Syria claim that their water supply was disrupted when Turkey built the Ataturk Dam on the Euphrates in the 1990s. There is some good news amidst an otherwise dismal regional picture. Israel has boosted water releases in the River Jordan in recent years. This has only resulted in a somewhat larger trickle, but it is still better than nothing. Ultimately, as populations grow throughout the Middle East, so does the water demand. However, in a region where it is nearly impossible to reach broad, multilateral political agreements, it is hard to imagine a deal being struck to manage water in a way that is equitable, sustainable, and less competitive. Several factors contribute to the Dead Sea's precarious state, including Israel and Jordan's usage of massive evaporation basins to harvest rich phosphates from the water for export as fertilizer. However, the precipitous drop in the River Jordan's volume best explains the problem. Tomatoes, bananas, and watermelons are grown by hand by a few families in the fertile soil near the Jordanian coast, where underground streams of fresh water flow down from the mountains. 
Salim al Huemel, one of the farmers, is deeply connected to the land, much like Nir Vanger was to Ein Gedi. As the young men of the village pick melons in the early evening cool, he declares, We'll never leave, even if the Dead Sea were to rise and sweep us into a sinkhole. In any case, we won't leave you. Villages and businesses along the coasts of both Jordan and Israel face the same threat from sinkholes. When the sea recedes, it leaves behind salt deposits underground, which can either collapse into enormous chasms or dissolve when fresh water seeps underground, causing the ground above to give way, creating a sinkhole. According to Dr. Gidi Baer of the Geological Survey of Israel, the area is an exciting place to be a scientist. Geologists are getting better at predicting where sinkholes are going to happen, which is important because several busy roads are running along the coastline. He told me, the number isn't linear, it's growing and accelerating. There were fewer sinkhole formations in past years than there were this year's estimated 700, a few dozens in the 1990s, hundreds in the 2000s. It's not hard to figure out what's wrong with the Dead Sea, given that it's been drying up for at least a century ever since those pesky British engineers etched their initials into the rock. Geologists point out that the water level has likely been both higher and lower in the past. Deciding what, if anything, should be done about the water level is a far more complex scientific and political matter. Any effort to save the Dead Sea, whether to reduce the pace of decline or to do something far more ambitious and start raising the level again, raises the question of what those costs and benefits would be. A massive pipeline across the desert from the Red Sea, far to the south, is the most likely plan to revitalize the Dead Sea if the waters of the River Jordan are not to be restored. That's for the video. We will be right back. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Share this video with your family and friends and hit the bell icon to be notified when we upload more content. Thanks for watching.